Hey, I'm Tan Tan. Tan Tan. And I'm making a voxel game inspired by Cube World. I'm developing this game with the Rust programming language and a game engine called Bevy. It's been uh, three months since my last devlog, so I have a lot of stuff to show you guys. Ambient occlusion, how to loadable Rust code for world generation, how I implemented a clever texturing method, incredible player physics, and so much more. The reason it's been so long since my last devlog is pretty simple. You can't really call my voxel game a game, it's been more of a voxel engine demo. That is why I set up a task list of things I had to complete before I allowed myself to make another video on this project. A list of tasks that once completed, I can finally start calling this a game. Well, I have just completed this list and I'm super happy I can finally show you guys what I've been working on. This is what my voxel game looked like 3 months ago. It doesn't look that good, does it? We can give this scene some more depth by adding ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion is all about finding spots where the light is less likely to be reached. In the most hidden geometry, we will apply some shade to give it some depth. A vertex in the corner like this, for example, is surrounded by 3 facing quads. This is the darkest possible area. A vertex neighboring only two faces is slightly less dark, and of course a vertex with no facing quads is fully lit. I followed this article that explains how you can implement ambient occlusion in a voxel world. Essentially what I need to add is a neighbor counting method. In theory it's not hard to think about, I mean you just count the neighbors, how hard can it be? One, two, three, easy. But implementing this in code was another story. I had to visually go through step by step, voxel by voxel, to figure out how to sample the correct blocks based on what vertex we are constructing. I even went as far as surrendering only specific corners of a voxel so I can see that my neighbor counting method works. This doesn't look correct. This voxel has one, two... Yeah, this is what it's like sometimes. It's not the worst thing in the world, but this is stuff I have to do. If I have three neighbors, maybe I want my corners to be shaded 100%. If I have one neighbor, maybe I want to shade it by 10%. Maybe I want to change the shade color. Well, these values I actually send to my shader so I can tweak it at runtime. Very neat. And of course I'm using the Bevy Inspector plugin to get this lovely UI. It was so worth it to implement ambient occlusion. It looks a hundred times better with ambient occlusion turned on. What else can we do to make this game look better? Texturing. Now the game Cube World does not use texturing and it still looks amazing. But texturing is still something I want to experiment with. I will try all the things so I can find a style that fits my game. I have this texture array and in the shader I can pass an index to what texture to use. Stone could return index 0, grass could return index 1. That would be very easy to do but it has its limitations. We can only have one texture per block type. I want blocks to have the option to have a top texture, side texture and the bottom texture. So I had to come up with a creative solution. Surprisingly, uh, one reason I like Rust is that unit tests are really simple to write. This is actually a good example to show you guys how I implemented the texturing. I have this voxel texture dictionary struct. Now the way you set up this struct is supposed to be done in the same order as you did your texture. Grass has a top texture, it has a side texture, we only have one texture for the snow, and that's the setup. I can then call a function that gives us the correct texture ID based on the block input and the side that we want to render. If we ask for the grass bottom block, we have not defined that, so in this case the default top texture will be returned, that's index 0. The grass side block is defined, we get the index 1. And all sides of the snow block use the same texture, so they all get index 2. I don't know how other games implement this, but I am very pleased with this solution. The way it works under the hood is that I basically have a list of the block type and three booleans. The booleans indicate if the top, side or bottom texture exists. If I were to ask for the snow block and the bottom side, it will count from the start how many textures exists before that one. My implementation isn't using a boolean array though, I'm just using a plain old integer and doing some scary looking bitwise operations. It's fun to do that. A really cool feature I've added is hot reloadable rust code. You heard that right, hot reloadable rust code. I can have the game up and running and the code that generates the forest biome. I can change a few variables. I compile the change and by tapping a key on my keyboard while the game is running, the game will swap out the old generation code with our updated code. 
Currently, the world doesn't reset, so you have to fly a bit to load in some new chunks. That is something to fix. Figuring out how to implement ultra loadable Rust code wasn't so hard for me because I have done a really cursed project where I added Rust support to Unity. I needed to do a lot of similar stuff I needed to do in this project. The world generation code does a few things. We get the height value given a 3D position. It's amazing how three lines of code can produce the shape of the forest biome. There's also a function for getting the block type of a 3D position. Grass, stone, snow. And there are some other miscellaneous functions we don't really care about at the moment. Now instead of having these functions built into the compiled game, what if we moved all of these functions into a DLL instead? There's a Rust library called DLopen that lets you load DLLs into Rust and use them. This library is surprisingly easy to use but implementing the hotter loadable code isn't as straightforward. If my game is talking to this DLL and I happen to recompile it, things tend to go terribly wrong. That is why when my game starts I make a copy of this DLL file that my game will use. Now I can freely compile my DLL without crashing anything. When I tap the key to hot reload, I make a copy of this DLL and when the code isn't busy using this old DLL, we can swap it out with a new one and then delete the old one. I know it gets messy, the code is messy, but surprisingly it works like a charm, even though I barely know what I'm doing. When I release this game though, this feature will be disabled because I have no idea how stable this implementation is. Who knows if this will work for other computers. Nonetheless, this will be a really nice tool to have when I work on the world generation. Let's talk about physics. It's by far the biggest thing that's been holding me back this last three months. When we get the player that can move around and interact in the world, we can actually start calling this a game finally. All you can do is explore the world, but hey, it's still kind of a game. An important behavior my game needs is the ability to jump up one block automatically. I don't want the player to constantly need to jump, like in Minecraft. Now Rust has a 3D physics library called Rapier 3D. I have no prior experience with it, but I figured let's give it a shot. The first thing I had to do was to generate the collision shapes for the world. That's easier said than done because my voxel engine constructs the world with my own special format. I had to convert my voxel data into a format that Rapier 3D can work with. My first test was to add a box, seems to work just fine. I added a player and now some oddities started appearing. The character would get stuck every other block for some reason. Now gathering footage for this, I couldn't find this problem. It seems to work any git version I try, was I dreaming all of that? But anyway, I just couldn't figure out how to get physics working. Something else that wasn't working was collision events firing like the collision every other block. This seems to be a bug, so I filed a bug report, I even made a reproducible demo, and they fixed the event bug a few days later. But nothing was going right for me, so I thought maybe I need to build up my physics programming skills, so I made my own 2D physics engine. I felt that if I had a deeper understanding how a physics engine works behind the scenes, maybe I could figure out why nothing was working for me. My motivation was really low for a long time. I wanted to work on the voxel engine, but I was working on this 2D physics engine instead. <sighs> From the darkness a sliver of hope emerged. From the Bevy Discord showcase chat. You see, I'm not the only one making a voxel game with Bevy. Nest is making a voxel game called Sh Sh Shikataganai. They have working physics. Actually, really good feeling physics. It's open source and they are also using Rapier 3D. So you know what I'm gonna do. I struggled for a day figuring out how their method works. Long story short, they use ray costs. Their method was actually so good that when I figured out how it worked, I managed to change it up a bit so the player can traverse over one block height without having to jump. Back on track, baby! We have physics! This felt like a total waste of time though. Anyway, now we need a camera controller. One following the player in third person and a debug camera to play around the world. There's a very interesting library I've had in the back of my mind called Dolly. This library is all about dealing with cameras. They have a bunch of example code for dealing with different kinds of cameras. You have this camera rig builder where you can add different kinds of behaviors. You can have a arm rig, you can have smoothing functionality. It's truly a beautiful system, it works really well. The only problem I had was updating from Bevy 0.7 to Bevy 0.8. You see, Bevy and Dolly use the same math library, Glam. In the Bevy 0.8 update, they updated the Glam version, whilst Dolly uses an older version. So what I have to do is convert my vectors and quaternions from different Glam versions, making the code a bit harder to use, but 
It's fine. I've also done a little bit of game design work. I designed this simple damaging formula that is some sort of mix inspired by Maple Story and League of Legends. Your character will have some stats, and the spells the character will cost has info on how to interact with the coster stats in order to do damage or heal. Of course we don't have any spells the player can cast yet, so to test this I made a simple demo where a player shoots some sort of spell projectile. I'm here showcasing 4 different spells that scales differently with magic damage or physical damage. Attacks can miss, they can be a normal attack or a critical attack. I'm not gonna go into detail how this works because that would be really boring, it's just a bunch of numbers. But what I can say is that I'm using a stat management library called GameStat. This will allow me to modify the player stats with the weapons or power-ups. This library is incredibly amazing! The creator must be a genius! Oh wait, I made this library. I even made a video about this library so you can check that out. <laughs> I need some sort of damage indicator text in the game so we can see what damage we deal. The demo I'm showing here lags a lot. It's the only footage I have right now. I'm sorry for that. Anyway, I found this text mesh crate for Bevy. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for Bevy 0.8. So I can't showcase that in the current game. Quick edit. I just saw that they had an update for it, so ignore that. But still, I'm not sure if I will use this plugin. I might try another method of text rendering. Some sort of billboarding text would be more fitting, I think, for my game. So the groundwork for the damage system is implemented. All we need now is some spells and stuff to kill in the game. But that's for a future update. In other news, I've completely changed my workflow. Instead of using VS Code and the Vim plugin, all my development is being done with the Helix text editor. Not much more to say about that, except that I love it so far. I've been using it ever since I made this video. Development have slowly chugged along, but the project is moving forward. Of course, motivation comes and goes, especially hitting huge obstacles like not getting physics working for a long time, struggling with ambient occlusion for a long time. But having passed so many hurdles now, it is so satisfying to take a look back on all the hurdles I've gotten over. Prior to this project, I haven't done much multi-threading, bitwise data compression, shader programming, project structure, optimization profiling, mesh generation, rendering techniques like ambient occlusion, unit testing. All of these things I have had to expand my knowledge in, which is why this project is going forward so slowly, but it's also one reason why I love this project so much. I'm growing so much with this project. Anyway, I gotta get back to work now. Lots to do. Next episode, we will have some enemies we can kill. Hopefully. Like the video. Subscribe. Bye.